All right. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the kickoff of our very exciting Lamson Academic Unit series called Across the Curriculum, um, where we are doing clustery things um, to support you in your work with students. And we're going to kick it off with Martha Burtis talking about the digital habits of mind. So with that, I will send it over to Martha. Thanks, Robin. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I've got some slides here to just sort of guide the conversation. They're way more, um, they have way more text on them than most slides I usually use, but um, there's a lot to kind of dig through with this. Hold on. And then I we're gonna have a conversation because Dr. Chi, we have to get, go quick because he's got another point. Oh yeah, 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 we do. We but um, Dr. Chi has, has, has many, many smart thoughts about yes. digital habits of mind. So um, so this is a little bit of a repeat of a, a, a workshop presentation we did during UDays last summer, um, but I've tried to go a little bit further with it based on some of the uh, kind of critique and questions that came up at that event. But to begin with, this is just a refresher of the habits of mind at PSU, which probably most of you are familiar with that are built into um, the first year, um, the first year course tackling a wicked problem is where students are really introduced to these as um, habits of, of learning and thinking and being a student here at PSU. We've got purposeful communication, problem solving, integrated perspective and self-regulated learning. There's definitions up here, but they're pretty self-explanatory what those four things are. And as I said, you guys are probably pretty familiar with them. Um, the reason why this whole thing, digital habits of mine, uh, came about is that about a year ago, um, as part of some work I was doing with the Academic Tech Committee here at PSU, um, a group of us, kind of a very varied group of um, faculty and staff from across the university, um, took on the task of trying to think about this question of digital literacy within the context of PSU and what that might look like. Um, digital literacy, I'm going to throw some definitions up here. Digital literacy is by far, by no means a, a new idea. Um, it's, you know, as a concept been around and be, and been grappled with by professional organizations and universities for over a decade. What is it? What does it look like? Not to it, mention Kristen Wixon, who just grapples for fun. Yes, that's concept. right. Um, what is it? What does it look like? How do we teach it? Um, why does it matter? Um, so these are a couple of definitions, one from the ALA, um, one from the University of Liverpool, and one from JISC, which is a professional organization um, in the UK. Um, and you'll see that there's some commonalities here um, among these definitions. One, if, you, if you spend a lot of time reading digital literacy definitions, they all kind of start to sound the same, <laughs> even though all, you know, to their credit, all of these different organizations and schools are really trying to be nuanced in their thinking about this. Um, but you see emphasis on certain verbs like find, evaluate, create, communicate, problem solve, critic think critically, generate, um, living, learning, working. So it, it really, it's about kind of trying to understand the practices of digital literacy that we want students to experience um, in our school, in our schools, in, in, in their education, and how we go about um, witnessing that, quote unquote, measuring it or assessing it, um, so that we can. A lot of times, these are you know, these are definitions that are, people are trying to pin down because they want to be able to share with their accrediting agency, or they want to share it with their state higher ed office, or they want to be able to put it in. Your promotional materials are part of their strategic planning to help guide the development of curriculum, the development of programs. Um, so we really were trying to grapple with like, well, what would digital literacy look here at PSU? And we had a couple meetings kind of going around and around it, looking at these different definitions. There's lots to analyze there. There's lots of stuff to think about. Um, but where we landed, which I love, um, and it was proposed, I believe, initially by Kathy. LeBlanc, um, 
was to think about the habits of mind, which are already an existing framework here at PSU. So we've already decided that there's value to thinking about education through the lens of habits of mind. There's value to our students. We've already invested in um, preparing faculty to teach with and through the habits of mind. We've already hopefully begun to develop in our students some capacity around habits of mind. And looking at where's the intersection between habits of mind and digital literacy. And the reason I love this is because instead of coming up with like yet another definition of digital literacy, which we could do, and we would probably end up with some words that look a lot like the words on the previous slide, we're really putting digital to, to use, right? We're really, we are using it to inflect and understand something that we already do here at PSU and to deepen our understanding of it and extend our understanding of it. So it just felt like a really simultaneously pragmatic way of addressing the problem, but also once you started to really explore it, um, there's actually some really interesting and creative and kind of, um, I think, exciting opportunities there because it is a framework, the habits of mind that we already know and we're already comfortable with. And this is just a way of getting people to push a little further. Um, so this is the statement that we kind of developed. One of the key strategies that PSU faculty use to help students succeed is through the integration of our habits of mind, a set of four ways of thinking. Digital literacy at PSU can be taught and observed through the habits of mind framework. Through this lens, we can understand how digital ways of thinking and knowing deepen and reinforce these habits. So that was kind of the, instead of writing a statement that was a definition of digital literacy, we kind of hung this on habits of mind. And I'm gonna open up this document um, and share the link here in the chat because I'd love it if you guys could. I didn't, there's a lot of verbiage here and I did not wanna put all of this in the slides, um, but I think for the next part, it would be great if people could, hold on, there's a lot going on here in chat. Raplin Wixon, obviously missing stuff in the chat. Hopefully that link works. Um, and what you'll find in this uh, document is basically just um, that statement that I just read and then a longer definition statement for each of the habits that um, speaks specifically to the inflection of that habit with a digital approach, a digital mindset. Um, so we're gonna come back to this. If you can have that on your screens for this next part, that would be useful. So going back to the presentation, um, I wanna kind of jump into, I think the best way to sort of illustrate this and understand this is through some examples. Um, and this was the other thing I really liked about our, our approach. We wrote those, those statements but we kind of wanted to do a check on ourselves. And so among the group of faculty who were participating, um, we asked people to offer suggest suggestions of examples from existing courses that could be used to help us understand what a digital inflection of that habit might, um, might look like in a class. And the idea being that like, if we're really doing this, like if we were really doing habits of mind already, and we know that we have some cool digital stuff already going on in courses across PSU, we should be able to find, I mean, they may not be the perfect examples yet, there might be more work that we could do, but we should be able to find some examples that help us to sort of um, come to a better understanding of what this means. So I'm gonna go through each of these examples and I'm gonna ask for a volunteer when I pull up each of the slides, since we don't have that other document open at the same time, I'm gonna ask before I go into it for one person to just read the blurb from that document I just shared in the chat um, for each of the habits so that we can hear that while we think about um, this question of like, how is this example an example of what we're talking about? Does that make sense? Awesome. So this is the first one, purposeful communication. Can somebody read me the little blurb from the document? Um, a purpose, thank you, Robin, purposeful communication. I'm so proud that I have the right thing up. Um, students consider the audiences and contexts of communicative messages, evaluate digital formats of social media and web design to understand how they intersect with those audiences and contexts. 
and construct meaning with appropriate tools based upon that evaluation and consideration. So the example that we have here is from a course, um, I'm trying to remember who teaches this. I think it might be Abby. Um, no, it's Sarah. I think it's Sarah Parrish who teaches this course. Um, gender and representation in sports. I think this is, yeah, this is a TWP that I'm pretty sure Sarah Parrish teaches. Um, and in this course, students have to um, take a, a, a topic, gender representation in sports, and create some kind of digital representation of their research and um, what they've learned about it. But part of what they do is they look at various um, online tools, social media, building a website, various spaces and tools where they could share these messages, learn a little bit about the affordances of those tools, and then make critical decisions about how best to represent the ideas that they want to communicate. So I have a little box over here about how, what makes this purposeful and digital, because this gets back to what I was saying when we did this workshop last summer, there was a little bit of question and um, critique concern about like, okay, that's an example of purposeful communication, but is it uniquely interesting or different than what students do with purposeful communication and non-digital contexts, right? Like what is the inflection here that's important or interesting or different or unique for our students that has to do with this being a digital project or a digital assignment? So I wanna just open it up if anybody has any thoughts about like how this project might be considered an example of purposeful communication, not just purposeful communication, but digital purposeful communication. Yeah. Well, I'm interested in the fact that you ask the question, you know, I, maybe it's less about the project and more about the fact that in the project, you, you and whoever teaches it, I guess, is asking the question about how and why the medium matters, you know, and how that functions. Um, because I'm thinking it's, it's not so much about the use of the tool, and this is what we talk about with a critical instructional design, as you've taught me, um, but it's really about the questions that you're asking about your use. Um, so, you know, since the beginning, people have used different technologies to communicate different things they're learning, right. but usually the technologies are somewhat invisible. You know, we, we just think of them as, conduits, right? Like blank conduits for content. But it sounds like one of the differences here is that the assignment is also saying when you pick different platforms and pick different tools, how are you reaching different audiences? How are you constrained by different options that the tool gives you? Um, and certainly with gender, that's going to be pretty interesting when you look at things like, you know, TikTok talk versus whatever. So I think maybe it's about, um, I think that'll be the challenge, right? For a lot of people to just be like, oh, I'm using digital things, right? So to get back to that critical one seems to be the key again. I don't know what Any, other people think. Yeah, thank you. Any other thoughts from folks about why this might be considered uniquely, not just purposeful communication, but purposeful communication considered through a digital inflection or lens. I think, um, and I think this is echoes what Robin was saying for me, in some ways I feel like purposeful communications of all of the habits is the one that if you, a lot of digital projects could be about purposeful communication of digital spaces and tools. And in fact, if I'm remembering correctly, when we did this last summer, what a lot of people said is, well, all of these examples seem like on some level, they're really about purposeful communication, right? As much as they are about any of the other habits. But I think I agree with what, if I'm, uh, if I'm correct in, in restating what Robin is saying, I think I agree with Robin is saying, which is that part of this is about intentionality 
and how we talk to our students about this work with intention because these spaces, all digital spaces and tools are coded, right? They are all, they have affordances, quote unquote affordances in a different way than traditional media have affordances because they are mediated, you know, because they are coded and mediated. And so like, for example, when you post something on Facebook, you are restricted. You have restrictions about what you can post and how you can post it because of the way that space is coded. That's different than if you put something in a book, right? Yeah, there's restrictions that it has to be able to be printed on paper and put between like two covers, but in terms of, and it has to be text, but like it's, it is what it is, like whatever you decide to share on that, no, no person, no organization, no company has restricted what you can do with that medium. The same way all of the spaces that we operate in online um, have restrictions that are, are, are kind of foisted upon us by whoever has designed or coded that. Yeah, Matt. I want to, because I, you know, I've been thinking about this for a few days now because I thought it was easy and then I got into thinking about it and realized it was not. Um, and I was just thinking as you were talking that maybe it's a question of lens and emphasis. So what the digital habits of mind do is they take the purposeful communication lens and add on to that the lens of the digital so that, there, that if we're thinking about the digital habits of mind, we're thinking about purposeful communication through the lens of the digital. Um, so we've still got the, the purposeful communication, but we're also asking, if we were asking of students for this, um, that they would be thinking about the, the technological part of it so that gender representation in sports, for instance, is different in an environment that includes social media than it is in an environment that is not. Um, you know, the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue is different in an all analog world than in a world where people are making memes of it. Yep. Um, and so that that sort of is a way of um, it, it focusing students. Yeah, and I appreciate your saying that because I think I'm probably guilty of using these words interchangeably like lens and inflection and emphasis, but you're right, they mean different things things potentially and being intentional about our choice of, of the metaphor that we use for this, I also think helps us both to understand how to share that with students, but also for students to understand what, what it is we're trying to do. Um, let, let's go into the next example. So this next habit of mine is integrated perspective. Um, does somebody want to read us the little blurb from that document of integrated perspective? I want a dramatic reading from Matt Cheney of integrated perspective. All right. Um, <laughs> Just because I know he's... Oh, this is in a different order. Okay. Integrated perspective. Students not only learn about the potential of networked and digital spaces to expose them to new beliefs, values, and ideas, but how digital networks have reimagined the entire notion of community and participation. Through collaborative, iterative, digital and online projects, students integrate their own learning with the learning of others, both at PSU and beyond. That was beautiful. He reminds me of this guy I knew once named Professor X. Do you remember? <laughs> Uh, vaguely. He was very annoying. <laughs> he was such an annoying guy. Um, so yeah, so this, this example is, um, this is an example from Abby Good um, of students who every time she teaches this class, um, return to and revise a ongoing uh, student created press book called The Student Theorist, an Open Handbook of Collective College Theory. Um, and so uh, Matt and I got into a little bit of a, a debate the other day about like, oh, we weren't disagreeing. We were just trying to think through this of like, how is this different than say, if a student did a project one semester, an analog project one semester, and then students a next semester revisited it or built upon it or worked on it uh, differently. So I'll throw this out to the group. Like, can we think of ways that this project is, is unique because of this digital lens um, that, that's, that's unique from what, and different from what a student might experience, what they might learn, um, 
if this if this was replicated through analog media. Any thoughts? Um, one thing that occurs to me is that like the, you've drastically changed the audience. I think when you know we, we talk about like the disposable assignment that only the professor ever sees, and and you could do an analog um, work that was seen by like maybe a broader class, but you're not going to get anything like the reach of um, something you put online. And I also see in this tiny little screenshot. I mean, I see a CC license attached to that, which you mean is inviting propagation of that work. Um, and I do think students think about it really differently when they know that those different audiences are there. Yeah, and as you're saying that, Kristen, I, this is something I hadn't even thought of too, but of course, because you you drew our attention to what, what, I, what you sh of course are gonna draw our attention to, which is the CC license, that this isn't a press book. And that, again, like I keep coming back to this word and like people who've like been involved with design forward know like, I, it's basically all like, like I'm like a one word for like that's I've only got one word, which is intentionality. Like I just keep coming back to it again and again and again, which is like if you taught this to students and you're like, OK, we're going to use this press book and students did like they got accounts and they logged in and they added stuff, they edited stuff. And yeah, it lived on the Web and they kind of knew there was like a URL, right, that could be shared. That would be the exact same outcome as if you did what I'm going to suggest you should do. I mean, presumably the same outcome, which is that instead what you do is you act actively talk to them about what is the press books platform? What does it mean when we assign a CC license? Talk to them about the fact that like within press books, you can export that entire book, import it into another instance of press books and just start, you know, messing with it, doing your own thing with it, creating something new, creating something different. The product itself, which is just a press book, would be the same. The difference is in that second model, with intention, you are actually opening up and exposing students to what the digital lens is, right? As opposed to just being like, okay, it used to be we, we wrote something on a piece of paper, now we're doing it online. Now you're actually contextualizing that by talking to them about what it means to be doing this in a platform like this. Yeah, Robin. Yeah, it just makes me think that when we talk about this stuff with students, we should start even a step back by talking about that word digital, because otherwise I think, because you can almost hear it in this conversation, you get this kind of fake dichotomy between analog and digital, um, as if analog is neutral and digital, make something different, right? Instead of thinking, you know, I always go back to Jesse talk, Jesse Stommel talking about, um, you know, a pencil as a technology. Instead of thinking in general about how different kinds of technologies and sort of tools and mediation change and that digital is, is one step, online is kind of a whole other step. And so I think also, because it's one of the things our faculty may be sort of seduced into in a world of higher ed that is so interested in face-to-face -face versus online. So it's like digital, but really what we're talking about is um, in with any platform that you're using, paper or anything, you're talking, and we've talked about this with paper, like in composition, you talk about, who's your audience for this piece of paper? You know, where is it going to go? And um, so I think it's like the digital has a whole bunch of particular things that are worth learning, but those particular things exist for every kind of technology, you know? And so I, I'm just starting to be interested in like the phrase digital literacy and maybe it be, you know, we should use it, but maybe it'd be better if it was kind of like technology literacy and technology literacy would encompass all kinds of mediated approaches to thinking and learning, right? Yeah, it, it's interesting too, as you say that, because, and I, I could be wrong about this, but like I have this gut instinct that um, like, if you look at various media, like if you look at a pencil compared to a um, like blogging on medium, right? Okay, like using a pencil to write on a piece of paper versus blogging on medium. That yes, they all have um, like every 
they're both technologies, they both have affordances, but medium is not neutral and is political in ways that a pencil, I'm not sure, does it have the same, I'm not saying it doesn't have any, like there, there isn't any debate about neutrality or politics with a pencil, but I think mediated digital spaces come with a kind of baggage that a lot of analog media don't, not all, but most don't. I don't know. I'm like kind of thinking about this out loud. So I'm not sure. I would love to like keep thinking about that with all of you. Um, but let's move on to our next example. Uh, problem solving. So somebody want to read me the problem solving blurb from that PDF or that Google Doc? New volunteers. Thank you, Kristen. I'm just gonna find it. Problem solving? Yeah. Um, students find and explore problems using digital and online information. Learn how online spaces and communities impact the investigation and understanding of those problems. Design new ways of solving problems with digital tools and share their solutions with a broader online audience. Thank you. So the example that we have from this is from um, a TWP that Kathy LeBlanc has taught on climate change, where students contribute articles to a climate change claim investigation website. So now I'll throw it back open. If anybody has any thoughts about how this kind of problem solving, right? Students are investigating. And this is a little bit of a trick question, I will kind of admit here. Um, but how students are investigating climate change claims and then sharing them on a course uh, blog or website, like how is this kind of problem solving with a digital, is there a digital lens here that's, that offers some kind of unique experience for our students? Nobody's going to answer you because the chat has gone so far oh. off the philosophical deep end, which luckily for people watching the recording, we will not be sharing with you. But let me tell you, you could go down a massive rabbit hole with these questions. So keep talking, Martha. No, I want to talk about the chat now because I really want to talk about the neutrality of pencils now because I'm like so interested in like the politics of a pencil. And I'm also thinking about like the, his, his, the history of that, right? Like how the yes. politics of a pencil a hundred years ago were different than the politics of a pencil now. Did you know that Henry David Thoreau's family got the graphite for their pencils from Bristol, New Hampshire? And they were the second largest pencil maker in the world because of the, the changes in the pencil that Henry created. They say all politics are local. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay. But now so, I'm also wondering, can something be more embedded in capitalism than something else? <laughs> That's really blowing my mind. I'm just wondering if Ticonderoga is actually making me do things I don't want to do. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about the problem solving though. Anybody want to think with us aloud about how this example might be considered unique? and considered through a digital lens, this example of the climate change website. And like I said, it's a little bit of a trick question and I, I'm happy to jump in if, if people are like, I don't really know, Martha. Well, I think it's interesting that it's, that a lot of the digital stuff is built to be less broadcast and more interactive. So it seems to suggest that its audience in some cases can be somewhat participatory, whether you're trying to persuade them or engage them or whatever, there's kind of a sense that they're going to be coming in. And I mean, I guess with books, it's interesting, right? You turn pages, right? you're not like, you know, a lot of times you are involved, but it, I think there's an interesting, um, 
I don't know. I really just undo everything I say when I say it. I, I go back to thinking like, but actually that's less dissimilar than I thought it was. But anyway, I'm interested in the in the role of the reader seems less like a reader and more like a participant. Um, so I think it moves a little from the broadcast web, which maybe looks a little bit more like paper or books and more towards this um, portal effect that we can get with the internet sometimes. Yeah, I feel like when we shared this one last summer, this might've been the ones where people were like, well, this seems more like purposeful communication than it does you know, anything really like special about problem solving. Like they could see how students were having to make critical choices about how to represent and share their research and their claims but they couldn't really see the inflection or sorry, the lens. I think that's what we're gonna stick with for um, problem solving. And the reason I say it's a little bit of a trick question is that for me, this didn't really make sense until I went and I looked at the, the assignment description for what students were doing here because the research that they were doing for this problem solving assignment was all about web research. So really what they were diving into for those of us who are familiar with Mike Caulfield's like SIFT protocol for um, analyzing online resources, this was really as much about not just problem solving, but how has the dissemination of information and the sharing of information online changed the very nature of problem solving, right? Particularly because, well, partly because you have to now navigate a very complex terrain to figure out what truth is there, but also because you then have to share that information, reshare that in a digital context where it could be recaptured and manipulated as well. So to me, that was the, 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 the real digital lens. Yeah, Robin. I'm sorry that I keep talking, but it's a little bit like a graduate seminar, so I'm just going to enjoy myself. Um, because another thing I was thinking about is, you know, I was looking at that digital habits of mind preamble paragraph, and at the end it says, through this lens, we can understand how digital ways of thinking and knowing deepen and reinforce these wonderful habits. But it's just so ironic because right now, like most of the discussion about the digital is about how the digital is undermining these it's habits, broken. right? <laughs> like it's like, these are the exact opposite of the effects. I mean, I just heard a big thing on NPR today about, uh, well, I won't even go into it, but you know, it's, it's really about dis disinformation and the effects it's actually having on policy now and whatever. Um, so I'm also curious about it seems like in the in the language that we wrote originally, we had more sort of aspiration about the, like our students will use the digital in healthy ways, but it seems like now there, we should go back and put more about critique in there, yeah, you know, not just, a good point. not just like good use, right. but more understanding that, you know, even purposeful communication is problematic, yes. you know, in the disinformation landscape. So I don't know how I mean, you, you could would... argue that like misinformation memes are doing a really good job with purposeful communication, right? Like they know their, their medium, they know their audience and they know how to use it really, really effectively. And so we're not about, really wanting that for our students. Think about the main challenge with the digital right now and like anything related to ideas and the digital world. And then look at our four habits of mind and explain to me where we're going to address some of the shitstorm of the internet, you know, in those four things. So it almost seems like there's, you know, again, maybe I go back to the values framework or something, or it's like Matt, you said in your book review that I read today, um, you know, again, like, are these things enough on their own, you know, or, or does there need to be a framework? I am going to stop there because this is really just for you guys and whatever, but something to think about. All right. I'm going to go on to the last habit, which is self-regulated learning. Anybody want to read that last blurb on self-regulated learning? And I can do it if nobody is, is a game. If I can find it, <laughs> I'll read it. Students use digital tools and spaces to construct their own digital identity as self-regulated lifelong learners. 
They share ideas, build their own personal learning networks, develop their intellectual frameworks and make visible their learning. And the example for this are, uh, is a website that um, we put, we built for Ascent. Um, for those of you who are involved in Ascent, you may be familiar with this, um, this site. It basically has students create what are called digital resource cards um, over the course of that, um, their time in Ascent. And they're meant to be um, basically small artifacts that make visible um, students' understanding of the resources at their disposal and how they plan on using those resources to be successful as students at PSU. And it's kind of a collection. So if you go to the site, there's lots of cards there that lots of students have contributed and you can kind of just, you know, browse through them to get a sense of the kinds of um, resources that the Ascent students have have um, found to be or believe believed to be valuable for them as learners. Um, so anybody want to talk about how this example might be seen as an effective um, digital lens on top of self-regulation? And I'll say that in some ways, this is one that I struggle with the most, not so much because I don't think the potential is there. I'm not quite sure it's happened yet. Um, there's absolutely the, you know, there's absolutely students having to make um, independent individual decisions about their learning and their learning choices, but they could do that in like a, in like a, composition book, right? Like we're just happening to ask them to put it up on the Ascent website. There's definitely a visibility component to this though, because this is a public website that not only, I mean, the whole world can see it, but I don't think the whole world is out there looking for this website. More importantly, all of the Ascent students can see each other's resources and the faculty and staff that support Ascent can see those students' resources. And so I think that's kind of interesting in terms of self-regulation. And that is different than if it was in a composition notebook, right? Although I think as Matt said, it's not so different as than if students had written these on index cards and put them on a bulletin board somewhere on campus, right? There's also a little bit of a meta level organization that's going on here. Students are supposed to have to kind of organize and tag their resource cards. Um, I don't know that they're, they're using it as much as they had initially planned when they built this site, but I think there's some real potential and possibility there. Um, and what we can do in terms of tagging and organizing in a digital space is different than what we can do in physical space. For example, a card can be tagged in multiple ways and in multiple places, whereas in a physical environment, if you put something up on a bulletin board, it can only be in one place unless you're going to make a copy of it. So. All of that's kind of interesting, but I'm still not quite sure if this is the best example. Um, so I'd love to hear if anybody else has any thoughts about it. Yeah, I think uh, Robin was just talking about in the chat, the notion of educational pathways. Like I think if, if we started to build tags into little collections or paths or connections, then you would really start to see maybe some interesting possibilities emerge um, that could support self-regulated learning. Yeah, Matt. I, I have to run in a second. So I'm going to yeah. throw this out here. I have a bomb and I'm going to throw it. Now, Martha, you might have heard about a thing called domain of one's own. What? And I was thinking self-regulated learning. Domain of one's own is perfect for self-regulated learning because that's the part I struggle with with students in getting them to do our eports, which are part of domain of one's own which is that it requires them to figure out for themselves what they want to put out there. Yeah. And I can't, there is no way for me to tell them that because I'm telling them, uh, you know, the requirements are just to put something out there and make it personal to you. Yep. Um, that's really challenging for some students and requires a kind of self-regulation. Yeah, I would agree that when domain of one's own is, I'm going to say done well, as though I get to decide when it's done well, but when it's done well and authentically, I think it is the ultimate 
platform for self-regulated learning. I will say, having lived with domain of one's own for a long time, I've seen lots of examples <laughs> that are not necessarily that, um, which is not to disparage. There's lots of great stuff happening, but it isn't necessarily self-regulated learning. Um, but I think there's still a lot there to be explored. So, and Matt now has to leave that room and go into that room. <laughs> I'm also thinking, goodbye, Matthew. Um, I'm also thinking about um, the, like in the strategic plan committee, I, in one of the goals, I wanted to say, you know, we're doing all this work with our students and transforming higher education. And ultimately that got voted out because people wanted to focus more on transforming the education of our students. Um, but it seems to me like the project at Plymouth State, like, yes, serves our students, but there's also kind of a, a sense of a movement to me of like, you know, could we, could this be something that could especially kind of resist some of the problematic approaches to education that are happening right now? And I think without technology, you know, and without the digital it would be really hard to make that move from like thinking about education, from just thinking about the education of, you know, these individual students. Um, I feel like it's that, you know, that ability to contextualize more broadly that allows you to think more, it's easier to do more um, work on systems and structures, I think. Um, when you're in an analog culture, maybe the only way to do that is like you have to pass a policy or win a fight or whatever. But with the internet, you have the ability to do that by communicating with many. And ultimately, the potential is that the policies and the leaders follow. So I think like when those Ascent students do that there, as opposed to on in their notebooks, there is a potential to systemically alter education in a way that would have been much harder without it. Maybe. Anyone, anybody have any other? I have some thoughts, but yeah, Alyssa, go ahead. I like this example um, because of, uh, you know, it's a, it's a self-regulated thing, but I think we were talking about on one of the CPLC channels that that doesn't mean you're alone. So this is very much a, you've got connections to other people and that whole, um, you know, responsibility and um, uh, I guess the responsibility to your fellow student. Um, but I, I really like that aspect of it, um, especially with the tagging and potentially having, you know, paths or things like that. It's all, it's all connected and it's all context. Yeah, I'm, I'm putting a, um, this just made me think, our conversation just made me think of this. This is an old presentation from like 12 years ago from two former colleagues of mine, Gardner Campbell and Jim Groom from the University of Mary Washington. It's called No Digital Facelifts. And I love it because like, uh, it's been 12 years, we're still having the same conversations, but it, it really, to me, it gets at the heart of what it is we're trying to grapple with here when we're thinking about this is habits of mind, but it's digital habits of mind, which is that like, this isn't just about taking your traditional assignment and doing something with technology with it, right? It, I remember years ago when I was at Mary Washington working with this history professor, since this is getting recorded, I will not name the person. And um, we were at that point, I think it was pre-domain of one's own. We just had this uh, multi-site blogging platform called UMW Blogs. And she had been using it in her classes. And she, she and I had this meeting and she came in and she goes, Martha, it's just not working. And I was like, well, what do you mean? She goes, students hate blogging. It's a terrible idea. Students don't like it. We shouldn't be doing it. They tell me they hate it all the time. And I was like, well, can you tell me what it is you have them do? And she described her assignment. And she basically was asking them to do on the blog what she used to ask them to do in a composition notebook where they turn like a journal where they turn it into her every week. And I was like, well, how did they feel about it when it was in the composition book? And she said, they hated it. And I was like, well, moving it from a marble notebook onto a website isn't going to change 
anything, like taking the exact same assignment and just repurposing it in this digital space isn't gonna magically turn it into an assignment that students now feel intrinsically motivated to do. We talk a lot about like, oh, there'll be a public audience. And yes, that's true. But like, that isn't the magic bean that changes this. And so this presentation, if you have time to watch it by Jim and Gardner is getting at this whole idea that like, this isn't about just you know adding some tech to it so that students learn how to use a tool. This is about authentically thinking, how are we using this tool in this assignment? But more, again, what I keep coming back about to about it is how am I explaining, like what intentionality do I have and how am I sharing that with my students? Like how am I helping students to understand what this is and why I'm having them do this work? That's still not magic, but it'll be fun would be to do another one of these with some students who don't have to prepare at all, but it would just be fun to like toss some questions at them, uh, you know, and basically have this kind of conversation with students um, about their technology assignments, but also about their technology in their lives and stuff. I find this conversation like the slides are good, but we just need more of these conversations yeah. in general, I think, um, and maybe to model them more for students and other faculty as well, so that people don't feel like the cool thing about this group is we're comfortable with the fact that we don't know what a slide means. We might have to think about it. Does that work perfectly? I don't know. We, we don't care that it's not perfect, but this is never going to be the kind of model that you can just adopt, right? It's really a set of conversations. And I think, it, I hope people watch this video and enjoy. The I know, I feel like we should put the chat up too, but we didn't, you know, none of us agreed to that. So we're not gonna do that, No. Yeah. but I'm gonna read it. Um, there was a like a little bit of an activity here. I'm not gonna have us do it. It was like, if we were a big group, we would break into groups and try and reconsider an assignment in a way that is not digital facelifts, but that is authentic, like really thinking authentically about what it means to, to look at it through a digital lens. Um, we do have a little bit of time though, if anybody else has any, oh my gosh, did that just get I, hand delivered? I just got a hand delivered cafe drink from my barista. You're living the life. I love you. Um, so yeah, if anybody has any other thoughts, we have we have some more time to think. But in particular, if there is an assignment that you would like to imagine and get some help thinking about, like, well, this is kind of a habits of mindy assignment, but I'm not sure what it might look like if I looked at it through a digital lens. We could brainstorm that together, but we also can just keep talking. Anyone else? My thought is that if you want to be an active participant in a workshop, do not have an office that has glass walls. <laughs> If that was not working out for me. The, do, you I did hear. Venetian, hmm? do you have the Venetian blind that I have on my um, glass? Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. Hold on. <laughs> now that I've pulled us off focus.